Hello and welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Gavin Esler. My guest today is one of the world's leading proponents of creationism, the belief that God created man as outlined in the Bible around 6,000 years ago. Mainstream scientists regard the world as four billion years old and view creationism as unscientific nonsense, or more politely, as a quaint expression of fundamentalist religious faith. So why is there renewed interest in a theory swept aside by Darwin 150 years ago? John Mackay, welcome to Hard Talk. G'day Gavin, good to be here mate. What, why is there a renewed interest in creationism? Well I guess we've had, as you said in your introduction, 150 years since Darwin apparently swept away all opposition, but you've got to the point where stars like Richard Dawkins are being asked on PBS in the USA, is evolution a theory or a fact? And he basically says, well it, it's been observed, it just hasn't been observed while it's been happening. Now as the leading proponent of sort of atheistic evolution, that leaves an awful lot open to question. So people like me are saying, look, it's time we dealt with the real world, not the one that you theoretically want. The one bit, let's, let's start on one point of agreement. Yep. One bit that scientists would agree with you on is there are ways of picking holes in Darwin's theory. Definitely. They would say that, but yes. the question is whether what you have to advance takes us uh, any further. Who, who comes to your meetings? Who wants to hear your point of view? Well, I just flew in from Hungary on Saturday night and we had a meeting with Hungarian academics, one professor of information technology at the University of Miskolc, one leading physicist, uh, one geneticist. So obviously you get the academic spectrum as well, which is you know, a fairly new interest, often in, in, in the last 150 years. So not years, just Christian been groups. lay people who are largely Christian, but now it's mm. moving to the university academics because they've got to the point of saying chance, random, naturalistic explanations are simply not working. Now, I gave a, a one-line definition mm -hmm. of creationism. I want you to explain a bit about what you do believe. You believe that, what, every word in the Bible is literally true, it's the truth. Well, the biblical account, of course, is a book which got, got history in it. It's a book which got parables in it. So if something's a parable by definition, it's a story, not, not a historical fact. And Jesus always introduced his parables with that phrase. But there's much of it which actually claims to be history. And as such, it deserves to be treated as that. I mean, Charles Darwin's book is a book which claims to be history. And you've got two alternative histories to which any science student can say, if this history is true, what evidence would it leave in the present? But you, you believe, am I correct in saying, literally, that the world was created about 6,000 years yeah, ago by I God in six days? A literal reading of Genesis is not only the only one that makes sense, if you try to read it any other way, it just becomes a stupid story, not even of any value to religion. But there, you're in conflict with other religious believers. Never mind the scientists, for a start. You're in conflict with some religious believers right on that point. Un you're happy with undeniably, that. I'm quite happy with that. Where does, in your scheme of things, Neanderthal man fit in? Where does, where does all that fit in? Are we or are we not somehow descended from him and through him to the apes? Well, I think we can definitely rule out us being descended from Neanderthal now because, you know, we've got fancy genetic testing and he has at least 19 units on each uh, genetic unit different from us. So if you wanted to be dogmatic, he's come from us. We haven't come from him. But genetic testing shows that 96% of the DNA of a chimp is common to a human, doesn't it? Well, that's, so the, got figure. That that's the figure you get in textbooks. But number one, Neanderthal is not a chimp. Neanderthal has been removed from the display at the Naturalist Museum because he turns out to be a deformed human being. Maybe it's a dead end, but, but, but on, 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 the question, on the question of our relationship with chimps and so on, 96% of the DNA common between a chimp and a human. That okay. tells you something, doesn't it? It does tell you something. It tells you that statistics is the house of lies, as most politicians have realised for quite a while. So that if you want to say 96% of what, or actually the common figure is now 98.4% the same. If you're dealing with say 100 yards or 100 metres and you're throwing a cricket ball and you're happy to be plus or minus one per six percent, it really doesn't matter but much. If, but, many, many but if people you are dealing mm. with 10,000 miles or 10,000 kilometres, 1.6% 1 becomes significant. So let me apply it to you. We're talking about the genetic code. 
it's got lots and lots of genetic bits of information in it. What does 1.6% mean when it comes to code? Okay, I'll give you two sentences to illustrate how codes work if you change your percentage. God is now here and God is nowhere, have 100% identical letters in 100% the same order, and they are 100% different in meaning. So when it comes to code, just using the percentage similarity is a meaningless no, but no, argument. No one is saying that we are chimps, but they are saying that if 90-something percent of our DNA is similar to that of a chimp, then there may be some relation, just as God is now here and God is nowhere, are clearly sentences yes. in the English language using letters. And that they is were very created. similar. They were created sentences. You see, the reality is when you look at the genetic code of the chimp and the genetic code of the human being, one reason you're talking to me and not a chimp is that 1.6% difference really is unbelievably significant. And if folks go to our creationresearch.net website, you will find the latest difference amounts to 35 million different letters at least. Where in your scheme of things do fossils and dinosaurs come in? Because as you know, scientists believe the world is about 4 billion years old. Fossils predate homo sapiens, human beings? Well, the one thing I'm encouraging all English educators to do is to teach people the history of each scientific discipline. And what we call geology, the word was invented by the Bishop of Durham, six-day creationist Noah's Flood. Our basic precepts of geology from Nicholas Steno, six-day creationist Noah's Flood. Our basic identification as fossils as real animals are uh, really Nicholas Steno applying Christian belief that God is real, the world is real. If it looks like a shark teeth, God isn't out to deceive us. That's where our concept of fossils comes from. The rest is the attempt of people to remove the real reason we got to understand fossils and now evolution but is the when result. When people find fossils and say by carbon dating these are several million years old, you think they are lying to you? Well, number one, they wouldn't use carbon dating to do that, but the principle is the same. I don't accuse them of lying. What I accuse most people of is ignorance of how we got to that figure. And every student in a high school or a university needs to know how we got that figure. And I'll tell you how we did. You see, the man that we can really put at the centre of this is a person called Charles Lyell, who wrote the Bible of geologists in the 1800s, gave us a set of glasses that says the present is the key to the past knew nothing about carbon-14, but we use his glasses. Whatever carbon-14 is doing, it's always done. OK, Charles Lyell was a lawyer who, fortunately for us, his sister published his letters two years after he died. We know what he set out to do now. Quote, unquote, my aim is to get rid of Moses from science. OK, now there's the problem, not the data. OK, but you accept that dinosaurs did exist? Oh, I dig them up. I run you field dig, trips. Exactly. Come on, you, one of my field trips. I'd love, to, I'd love enjoy to. I'd love it. to. I'm sure I would. You accept dinosaurs exist. Yes. If everything was created as the Book of Genesis said, there must have been dinosaurs in Noah's Ark. Definitely true. So, Triceratops and Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus in Noah's Ark. No problem with that. Big Ark. You said, <laughs> Very well, big Ark. Well, look, I, I did, for your sake, bring along <laughs> something to uh, show you today. There is a cast of a baby dinosaur footprint. So there were baby dinosaurs ah, in Ah, dinosaurs, relatives of crocodiles, were born out of eggs yeah. about the same size. But so no problem with you, baby dinosaurs. You, do, you, do you see my point? Though? Well, you would have thought it might have been mentioned. You know, these would be rather spectacular Well, animals, I wouldn't look for the word dinosaur because it wasn't no. invented till 1841. But what I would look for, you see, the word dinosaur was invented by a creationist and they didn't tell you that at school and they should have. But you are saying there were dinosaurs in Noah's Ark. Yeah, quite no clear. No problem. Except I think they were called dragons in those days. Dragons. Okay, but the science, as you put it, of creationism, this is where many people have difficulties mm -hmm. with what you say. They're perfectly, your beliefs, whatever you believe, whatever I believe, what anybody watching believes is all acceptable. It's when you start to say there is a scientific basis for this. What is the evidence for what you have to say? Okay, I asked Steve Jones this on a radio program just a couple of weeks because he's so antagonistic to creation. I said, Steve, if creation is true, what would the evidence be? And there was stunned silence. Okay, and most of us have never even asked that question. But a person I did a debate with from Harvard University, Professor Krista Carlos, gave a brilliant answer. He said, a creation is anything that can't happen by itself. Now, the students in this country, the professors need to think that through. And here's the answer. A creation is something that can't happen by itself. In other words, the end product 
will have properties that do not come from the stuff it's made of because if evolution is true, the end product is simply the sum result of the natural properties of the universe. But as I suggested to you before, there is an argument with scientists, which we'll mm -hmm. leave aside just for one second. The argument within religion is one between you, for example, and the Archbishop of Canterbury who says, I think creationism is in a sense a kind of category mistake, as if the Bible were a theory like other theories. Whatever the biblical account of creation is, it's not a theory alongside other theories. There's no, it never claims to be right. a science book and it never claims to be a religious book either. What it claims to be is the truth. The and truth if for scientists all time. are interested in truth, then you have to be able to answer if a creation happened, how would you recognise it? Why do, uh, but uh, not just the Archbishop of Canterbury, also within the Church of England, one of the scholars, Stephen Sykes, says that the Church has come to terms with evolution. Evolution is not incompatible with a divine God. Absolutely not. Do you think it is incompatible with divine God? Well, I debated uh, Professor Polkinghorne last year in Liverpool Cathedral, a vast audience there, and the, the reality is he lost. He was trying to defend God could use evolution and the simplest argument doesn't come from a Christian, it comes from an atheist by the name of Jacques Monod, who basically said the most vicious, cruel, mindless process of e is evolution. Application, what sort of a God, like the God of the Bible, would use millions of years of death, struggle, kill or be killed, and have the audacity to call it good? Well, now, so it's incompatible oh, now, with the Christian now, now, God. Now, hold on. Uh, uh, as you well know, we live in a world of malaria, of mm -hmm. AIDS, of mm -hmm. terrible, b terribly bad things. If there is a God who is good and is all-powerful and these evil things exist, he precisely fits into the definition you've just given. No, he doesn't. You see, well, this is David Attenborough's problem and Charles Darwin's problem. I mean, Charles Darwin. So I'm in good church. company with that question. Oh yes, yeah, you're in good company. But, but, that's but right. Why? Why not then? If you said that a god would never create a world which is red in tooth and claw, well, he's created okay. a world in which there's AIDS. You've got a world in which God made the world very good, Genesis chapter one verse thirty-one. And I've still asked you the question, as I ask all the other scientists, if that is the beginning, how would you recognise the evidence? And they refuse to answer it. But your question is the next step. You see, he warned us there was one thing we were not allowed to do. And the biblical record says we did it. And the penalty of our disobedience has been to go from good to bad to worse. Uh, you want an application of it? Well, I'm for, sorry to interrupt there, but if that were true, then it could also be that the penalty for disobeying is evolution. That has produced no, no, no. the world No, no, no. The penalty for disobeying is devolution. Well, the opposite. change. 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 No, no, no problem with evolution. that at all. So you all. accept this notion of change. Then oh, you yes. Can, then devolution, evolution, you can accept. Oh, no, no, no. You see, I had a debate at Nottingham University last week, uh, sorry, the week before, and he was doing this. Evolution is change. Therefore, any change is proof of evolution. I said, sorry, if you start out with a perfect creation, any change is degenerative. So that you can start out in a world in which all the bacteria in your mouth have a wonderfully good job mm -hmm. to do, and then you in your foolishness invent soft drinks with phosphoric acid in them and you kill off well, half the bacteria and they chew your jaws instead well, lay of lay off the, the soft good drink. stuff. But, but you accept that God created the world, you accept that evil exists after the fall, you accept that that is a profound yep. change and yet yes. you don't accept evolution on the grounds that God would be cruel to create a world red in tooth and claw. No, it's no, more no. Cruel, no more cruel for animals to kill each other than it is for people to die of AIDS. But you see, Genesis tells you when the world was good, all the creatures ate plants. There was no death, no struggle. So the archbishop who wants evolution and God to go together is not talking about the God of biblical Christianity. And it's a key point. Let me, let me ask you about the God about, of Christian, Christianity in the Bible. Leviticus um, 25, 44 to 46, you may very well be familiar with this, talks about slavery. Mm -hmm. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen, and ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you. That was used to justify slavery. Passage from the Bible, very controversial. Okay, and the context is Moses? And the well, the context, yes. Tell us about the context. Okay, the context is Moses, and Moses invading the land of Canaan, and the Canaanites, well, the basic rule is they had absolutely rebelled against God and the penalty of sin is death. They deserve death. 
right? The reality is, if they are kept alive, you need to keep reading what the rules for slavery were. But, but if you had a day off, they had a day right, off, right? right? If you were treated fairly, they were treated as, fairly. As you, so biblical slavery and the sort you saw in America in the Civil are War. totally different. Exactly. In the 19th century, that passage was used to justify slavery. Yeah. And I'm suggesting to you that the context is indeed all. Your it argument is. is absolutely right. The context is indeed all. The context of the book of Genesis is also all. Which is it's a agree. very, very important story, no but problem. it is not contextually scientific evidence of the ah, origins of the no, universe. No, no, no. You see, what, what you've just done is turned it on its head. So you're saying, I can take Charles Darwin's story about well, history we, when we, he we wasn't Charles there. Darwin. No, 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 we're, we're, I can't. we're into God at the moment. We're yeah, into but God. the reality is, you're using the same thing backwards. You see, Charles Darwin has a story about a time when he wasn't there, and you're saying that's scientific, mm. and I can ask a no, question about I, it. I'm saying if context is important for mm -hmm. the Leviticus justification yes. of slavery, then context is also important for understanding the book of Genesis. No Very doubt about it. And if you agree with that, then you can agree, perhaps, that the book of Genesis is to be read for what it is, not a scientific document. Good. But it as never claims to be a science it, document. Exactly. It claims to be the truth. Uh, the truth. The truth about history. And you know that because? Simply because all the rest of the book treats it that way. So when Jesus is asked a question about yeah. a social issue of divorce, he says, haven't you read? Back in the right. beginning, God made them male but and female. the truth in context, the same as the justification for slavery, Presumably you accept that he gave you reason to be able to Definitely. argue with me in this discussion. He gave you reason to look at the book of uh, rationality, to look at the book of Genesis and say, yes, this is very important to me, but it's not science. But it is history. And you see, that's what evolution claims to be. And if this history is true, molecules turned into amoebas, which turned into politicians, then how would I find the evidence to verify it? If this history is true, God took dust and he made man, if that history is true, what would the evidence be? And you see, so far, the scientists refuse to even go there, but they are the same category of question. Would you accept there may be scientific evidence that you could accept that would prove you wrong? Oh, I can definitely even suggest it. You see, when you have a look at our classification system, invented by a creationist, right, Carl von Linn, who says if God has created creatures separately, if he has specially created them, concepts like species are real, right? And it works. Now the bottom line is, if it is true that amoebas turned into worms that became politicians, then animals have not produced their own kind and you've got a way of checking. If it is true that God has created things to produce their own kind, then somewhere built into a human being is a mechanism to stop you evolving. And nobody has observed any human being evolving. What we've seen is our immune system degenerating, courtesy of AIDS, courtesy of the environment, courtesy of Chernobyl, and that's the opposite of evolution. Make a distinction, if you would, between what you are talking about here and what is very current in the United States now, which is the concept of intelligent design, which yes. I've seen people refer to as creationism light. <laughs> is that fair I enough? I like that. That's well, really good. I'll remember that. <laughs> uh, I, I was asked about this by the academics in Hungary just on Saturday because they, uh, they have a traditional, far more European, Greek-type thinking academia than the Americans do. And you will find in America where, of course, they draw a line in the sand that we don't really have, separation of church and state. So if anything's even vaguely related to church, like Genesis, you can't bring it over here to the state school system or whatever. So they've come up with the argument. I mean, have a look at my boomerang. <laughs> Everybody this was for. who walks into the room believes that didn't get here by accident. <laughs> Somebody who existed before it, somebody who's not a part of it, somebody who is smarter than it, actually use their intelligence to make wood do what it won't normally do. You see, it's not the wood that makes this come back. It's the shape and the design. So this is evidence of intelligent design on a small scale. So everyone can recognise the evidence of intelligent design. And this group of scientists are saying, random chance, natural processes, time, just doesn't work. Because when we look at life, say DNA, it's made of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, phosphorus, etc., which don't do codes. You can leave them around for a million, zillion years if you like, they don't do codes. But DNA is coded. So it's got information in it which reflects intelligence greater than you can get from the parts. So these groups are saying, we want to say we need to admit 
intelligence has been used in the operation of the universe. Unlike me, they don't want to go further and identify which intelligence we're talking well, about. So it's a bit of a con then? I wouldn't say it's a con, I would say it's a very American phenomena because... <laughs> you, you, you think it's a con? You're just not prepared to say. No, I, I don't think it's a con. I think they're trying to play the ball game in the park that's been defined for them, whereas my s suggestion is, look, the park is not science versus philosophy, it's not science versus religion, it's truth versus error. Shift the game over here. Do you want, do you want what you were talking about to be taught in schools not as part of religious education or philosophy, and I think there'd be no argument that it would be, mm -hmm. but as part of science. Do you want it taught in the science curriculum? In well, I, I've been coming to Britain for 20 years and I've been teaching this in your science classes, your philosophy classes, and your religion classes, right? And yes, you can do it in all three. I did a debate against four professors in Canada, all at once, all science professors largely, except for the ecumenical clergymen. And the result of that was the local school board said, come and show us how to do this. So if anybody goes to creationresearch.net, clicks on the study guide, they can download the course we use in science classes here or in America. Scientists think you are talking rubbish. Yeah. That's why I asked Steve Jones, if creation is true, what would the evidence be? Stun silence. He does not want to even think of the question. Let, let, let me put to you a couple of things that uh, well, Steve Jones, for example, of University of College London, said it's very hard for anyone with two neurons bolted together to believe that the Earth was created 6,000 years ago. Deliberate irrationalism is dangerous, but it's most dangerous to the people that believe it. Well, that's certainly Steve Jones' opinion based on his atheistic approach to, to nature, but he's the same Steve Jones who in his Royal Society lecture said, we've got fossil HIV from 1959, variation XYZ, and by 2006 it became HIV variation WPK, and he said, if that's not descent with change, what is? Now the reality is HIV has turned into HIV, it's produced its own kind, and there's no evolution at all. Well, it's not, it's not just him, obviously. The Royal Society, the best scientific yeah. brains in Britain, said in April this year, young people are poorly served by deliberate attempts to withhold, distort, and misrepresent scientific knowledge and understanding. And they say that uh, what we know about Earth is not, what you're talking about is not consistent with the wealth of evidence for evolution. The American Association for the Advancement of Science takes a similar point of view. I mean, the, the scientific establishment says you're completely wrong. Well, do you know why they're getting worried? because more and more of your professors who 20 years ago were young men and young women who have begun to think, hang on, I can answer that question now about creation, and I know you can't take a million years to make a boomerang because it'll rot, are now professors in universities here, and despite all of the antagonism of the Royal Society, there's no doubt about it, creationism is having a bigger and bigger influence and will continue to do so. Do you, just to return to one theme that we began with at the start, do, do you except that you may, at some point in your life, admit that you were wrong? I, I have a fairly good track record of if ever I find out that I've been wrong, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it, although with a bit of Scottish pride and that having to be broken first. But the reality is I've also adopted something that I, I said in one of your public schools just two weeks ago. Because a student said, why aren't you talking about this? I said, because in all of my 59 years on this planet, I've not been able to reach a conclusion about that, and what I haven't got a conclusion on, I will not tell you. Right? So therefore, I've made it my business, if I can answer the question about what the evidence for creation would be, the students need to know how to answer that question, because schools should not exist to teach students what to think, they should exist to teach them how to think. That's why your faith schools are flourishing. I mean, your school boards have said the creation of schools are way up there. Why? Because they're teaching them how to think, not just what to think like the evolutionists are. John Mackay, on that note, thank you very much. Good on you, Kevin. <laughs>
on, on the flood. And they harangue me like one thing, because this is so controversial, right? And uh, anyway, afterwards, the professor said, well, come and have a drink. I said, fine. Now, my finishing line for that talk was, <coughs> all around the world, every tribe has a traditional story about both creation and the flood. And I said, there's only one exception. It's the tribe called geologists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Oh, we, should, we should restart the recording. You're absolutely, that's, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so anyway, but in the bar yeah. afterwards, he said, I admire what you're doing, yeah. even if I disagree with it. And I said, why do you disagree with it? He said, well, I just couldn't accept it. I oh, said, no, well, that's you've close... travelled all around the world. He said, yes, and I've noticed that they all have those stories. Yeah. And I said, but you oppose me publicly. You oh, on that. No, he's right, he's right. But you're right about it. But, but the interesting thing is that I have deba debated with creationists in America or intelligent design people who cannot conceive they could be long. Who can... no, then if that's true, then you're not in the science no, business at all. You have to think through, if I'm wrong, what would the evidence what, the, be? And but you have to... learning how to think. Anyway, the sorry, we, well, we want to do another half hour, is that oh, all right? Well, <laughs> Not an alternative half hour, isn't it? I enjoyed that very much, John, that was a Good pleasure. Question. Right. Say first before, by the standing up, please, thank you. Right. <clears throat> I, t I tell you another thing, John. My, uh, John, before you go. My, uh, my, my daughter is, uh, always goes on and on and on about, we have this argument all the time, about William Paley and, uh, and yeah. the watchmaker. I will tell him about, about the uh, yeah, boomerang maker, which we'll will... Uh... The course, because <laughs> what, what William Paley failed to do was actually define how you would recognise something that was deliberately designed. That's yeah. what he failed to do. He just argued logically. But if you but found now, it, once yeah. you found it, yeah. the, he took it from that point, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. But it's very, yeah, it's very interesting because she, uh, she's, she's only 14. She's very interested mm. in this. Uh, she, in, uh, because in Cordoba in the 10th century, mm -hmm. the Jewish philosophers and the uh, Muslim philosophers who lived side by mm -hmm. side before the Spanish Catholics mm -hmm. kicked them out, uh, were debating precisely yeah, this issue. thing yeah. in the 10th century. Well, I so we, to have a look at the study guides and download the search guidelines because what we spend is how would you recognise this if it happened naturally, which mm. is evolution, or if it happened deliberately? And that's what the course is about. And she will get a lot out of it. Right, thanks very much. No, I've got to do some work apparently, which is a bit of a drag. How do I do that? What do I do? Thank you. Somewhere here? Can I watch yeah. some tennis? Yeah, yeah. It, it's really quick. Oh, it's Murray years. playing. It's last year's stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah. I thought the weather looked a bit too good. <laughs> but was, has there been no play at all no. today? None at all. I was kind of pleased that it was going to be Wimbledon week, actually, because my garden could use the rain, and exactly I knew that it's the only thing. Well, that was lively. Yes. You really got into that. Oh, I did really get into it. I think it's quite interesting. Yeah, but he, but he's very different from from talking to the American creationists because the American creationists just you know, God has spoken to me. I know what, everything about everything, and uh, that's the end of the world. But he came back each time. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. Right, please, Gavin, from Help Lighting. Oh, back to where you were, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that I could be here in the dark or I could stand here oh, in the light, but it's up to higher. you, Rod, you know. Yeah, he says it's a golden shot. <laughs> <laughs> golden shot, is that like golden goal? <laughs> so anyway, how boring are England on a scale of 0 to 10? What do you think? Oh, right, yes, we didn't write a trail, sorry.
They'd use 1940. 